So welcome everyone to our third Wealth and Art on Web. I'm Elisa from the Art Advisory Local Content Partners and my colleague Massimiliana Palumbo. We are glad to welcome our guest, Marine Tanguy, who is the founder and CEO of MT Art Agency. Hi, Marine. So actually, your story of successful entrepreneurship undertaken with some visionary approach is not so far from our last guest. Manuel Faleschini, who was a successful entrepreneur in fashion. But today we are talking about a different industry as we will be talking about the art industry. Well, in Italy, we might not be used to talk about the arts in, term of, in terms of proper industry, but today the arts are more and more recognized as substantial players in the creative economy and industry. So almost all our economy today is an experiential and symbolic based economy which is largely nourished by creativity in different way to express it not to mention the fact that the art markets between auction houses galleries dealers has been accounted for 67.4 billions in 2018 according to the art market report by art basel and ubs as we know it's one of the most important reports which is not actually a very low amount of money or worth involving globally right so we cannot deny today that the arts are a proper industry there's an economy and you need to be an entrepreneur an entrepreneur to have some entrepreneurship to succeed in it as an art professional first but also as an artist today and i think marine is the perfect example as an art professional a woman entrepreneurship in the arts as well as her artist the artist she represents with their agency they are approaching the arts in a more professional way. So let me give you a little bit of a background on Marine, then she will explain better everything about their agency. Marine Tungi, she's the founder of and CEO of MT Art Agency, as we said, which is an award-winning and B certified agency, artist agency. And I feel she's one of the very few unfortunately but she's one of the very few very successful young women in the arts today in the art industry so passionate for art and advocated for artists since a very young, young age marine has managed her first gallery at the age of only 21st 21 and she opened her first gallery in la at 23 years old However, after she noticed and she acknowledged the restrictiveness today of the, the traditional gallery business model, she decided to change her approach and align it to something that were already applied by other creative industry as music or movie. So she started back in 2015 15 MT Art Agency, which is the first talent agency just working with vis visual artists worldwide, moving away from the traditional gallery business and proposing another way to offer a sustainable career to those artists. For whoever is kind of outsider or anyway just passionate about art but not actively engaged every day, the big question has always been how you define, establish the value of an artwork, an artist compared to another, why this artist is more valuable and then maybe more expensive than the other, how this value is determined. Well, I would say that it's an entire ecosystem which contributes to establish and acknowledge and champion the value of the art and the artist. And as we know, it's, it's only a symbolic value that needs to be to have some credibility within a system, which is first the art system. But I think the real value proposition that MT Art Agency has and Marine was championing is that they are trying to expand this ecosystem, not just within the art world, within the art system, but beyond with collaborating with brands and public institution constantly to build a successful for career for their artists worldwide. So this approach has actually been awarded to over the last few years. In just few years that they have already recorded different press reviews and they got different big prize. And for example, Marine was awarded with SAPE, uh, one of their artists of the uh, Forbes under 30s award 
and as well as other important prize. But I mean, I think that all your visionary approach, Marine, is more is, is well summarized by your motto, which is don't invest in art, invest in artists. What does it mean for you, this kind of proposition, value proposition you, you are offering us, and as well how you apply your vision every day in your daily activity as an agency and your relation with the artists and the art world? Well, first of all, thank you so much for the introduction. And as we were saying uh, behind the scenes before this live started, it's a huge honor to be in conversation with you. I think like there's so many aligned interests between the two firms, so it's, it's just really nice. So thank you so much for having me. Um, in regards to um, into your questions, I think it's really interesting because I believe in investing in people. I think it's that simple. Um, and the reason I, I believe in that is because um, you know, I don't come from um, a world of wealth and I had people investing in me. I had people saying, this young girl has something that she can build, you know, she can build a company. So before she has even built it, we will help her. We'll put resources behind her, we'll put finance behind her uh, because we think she can. And I think I've been constantly surrounded by entrepreneurs who were just doing that. They were backing people they believed in and then those people were basically becoming a bigger company or talent or you know a bigger reputation and and I think especially when I um, opened my gallery in Los Angeles and I encountered Michael Lovitz who started CAA so CAA is one of the biggest talent agency in the world so CAA um, he would have been behind the career of Steven Spielberg or Tom Cruise and when he mentioned how he was investing in people and how he spotted talent and made sure they had all the top resources I felt this was what I had gone through in life and what had got me to that level, but also what I felt therefore should be done to the art industry because if you do it towards athletes, musicians um, or actors, why would you not do it uh, towards visual artists? And the reason why is because as we all know, um, there's a type of people who is more resilient than the average. They will be working until 4 a.m. during a crisis, as I just demonstrated with the confinement, and they will be pushing, they'll be more ambitious than the average person. They will make sure that something that is not normally possible will become possible. And those characters are either your top entrepreneurs, your top artists, your top actors, musicians, writers, and they are the people that first I love working with because there's nothing more inspiring than working with people who are incredibly inspiring. Um, but also, there are people that I therefore, I feel very comfortable betting on. I think the painting that is behind me, you know, five years ago, he, you know, was selling them for 2,000 pounds now, it's already 20,000 pounds, and he's had so many amazing uh, successes along the way. So the, the, the personality and the fact that David has been so resilient and determined and ambitious and challenging the way he was making work and adding new techniques and being more innovative with it is is all um is all driven by him wanting to succeed um and therefore us spotting the fact that this is an artist that you know is incredibly driven to to be successful so that's my value and and i think i selfishly want to be surrounded by people who are absolutely fascinating um so i designed a company and a job so that I could basically get to work with them, um, which is what I do daily. So in regards to how this works is, you know, you will basically spot talents. Um, we are at the stage where now we're quite known for building the profile of our artists. So we also get approached by over 200 artists a month uh, to enter the agency. And then once you get someone here, it's really like in football, let's say, where you get a kid and then you get into the next league, right? Whereas well, the same in art where we'll be looking to increase their profile, and that is across press, across social media, across credibility, which will be placing the artist in the top collection, working with museums and institutions, but also building a larger awareness of who they are. And I've been coming back to something that I've loved that what you said, and, that, and I'm so glad that you saw this in us, is the fact that you mentioned um, the fact that the art market is becoming an industry, and the fact that like, you know, it is generating a lot of revenue, but actually I will argue that there's so many external revenue that you could bring within the art market. And, you know, if I look at um, um, our successes, because 
we don't just sell our work some walls. You know, we've also been able to bring cities and governments in in a big public art projects or in a long term public art projects, or also brands in making a collaboration happen. And I think this makes two things happen. It means that my talent has a much bigger awareness than just the industry, the art industry would have, because how many of us who are not in the arts may not be aware of who the top hands are in the arts. So it's good to bring them out so that this awareness is also larger. But of course, from a revenue perspective, it also means that we are tapping onto sectors who are much larger and so therefore can spend a much larger revenue onto a talent than, you know, um, brands are much more are much more used to kind of collaborating with talents in general, so they can therefore be spending in that sense as well. So that's something that I'm interested in. Um, um, I never did economics as my degree. I did philosophy and art. Um, so I think I hopefully construct ideas quite well. Um, but I'm actually fascinated by the economics of ideas because I want them to grow. Um, and, and like any entrepreneurs, I want them to scale. And whether it's my talent's reputation that I want to scale, whether it's us now having four offices, I'm constantly interested in how do you enlarge an idea for them to become basically a bigger economical reality. So we can go on, on a few examples of what we've done because like we said, Elisa, we wanted to keep it a conversation. So I know it's boring at this time to have a professor lecturing you, which no, I'm not I going to be doing. Must be asked the right <laughs> question for you, right? Yeah, 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 of course. Good afternoon, everyone. Time brands why they, you collaborate with them yeah thank you marine for your presentation from what we have just heard it clearly comes out the philosophy behind your motto and the reason that can lead a private neophyte collector to invest in artists represented by your agency by shifting the focus on the corporate side which it's more interesting for us we know that empty art agency promotes talent artists and develops art projects with different brands I would like to analyze with you what are the relationships between players involved in co-production of a cultural project. We know that financial institutions and more in general companies increasingly promote their image by combining it with art, for example, collaborating with artists and sponsoring their projects. In Italy, we have uh, various examples in this uh, different industry. I may mention, uh, for example, the last project of Ferragamo, the Italian luxury fashion house, which uh, recently organized a project called Sustainable Thinking, with aim to reflect, by means of the vision of art and the fashion, on important topic of the sustainability. Uh, in particular, um, the fashion house, in this case, set up an exhibition by choosing and inviting artists that used to work on these crucial and contemporary issues, such as uh, the relationship with nature, the use of organic materials. In this way, we know that the company can associate its own brand with a similar message to that we can find in the work of art exhibited. It's know that this kind of approach allows to benefit from the great image return that initiative related to the world of culture can have in comparison to more traditional marketing and advertising strategies. And furthermore, this activity, we know well because we are a law firm, um, may lead the company to obtain significant tax benefit, of course, depending on the applicable law that can be different from state to state. In line with this, um, one of the empty hearts ongoing projects is the collaboration with Union Bank Privé, uh, one of the most important private banks in Switzerland. And we, will, we would like to know more about this. Could you please tell us um, some things about this project? And in general, yeah. um, can you explain us how you collaborate with financial firm? Uh, in your experience, what are reasons that that can lead a financial institution to develop a project with your agency. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I think it's nice that we're on this page as well um, on the screen because I'm going to give you also incentives of why people actually want to work with the artists and, and what do they get out of it. So UBP, I mean, I'm incredibly excited about this because um, I really like them, I really respect them. As you said, um, they're very prestigious, so it's it's really it's really special for us to be able to kind of work with them. Um, so I think what's interesting from their side is two things. One is, you know, UBP has constantly been advocating for their values. They are trusted in the financial world, you know, to be coming, you, you will come to them for specific values and, and specifically in their press release, they spoke about a lot on sustainability is by the heart of it, diversity is at the heart of it, so, you know, 
there's a value sentiment, they still family run, they still very much trusted upon their values. Something like this, therefore, is, is perfectly aligned with the arts because my artists are authentic in their value system, you know. They picked because they believe in those values and then they've been advocating for these values for years and years and years. From a, from a pure communication and marketing level, then you get to align yourself with the same values and you get to build a storytelling that is aligned, um, which is here, um, I would say, the, the press release that we've worked on and, and to kind of give you an idea with UBP, they're opening a large space in Monaco. We have already sent 41 artworks there and this is going to be a space that will bus run jointly, uh, but they will receive their clients there. And they're going to do the same thing in London and also in partnership with us. So I think at that point, the art is really what I said about marketing and communication is a tool to enhance your values, but also visually, not just in words. As we all know, we are sometimes tired to be reading words. So the visuals from a social media perspective to a, a website perspective to, um, to a space perspective are much nicer to kind of encounter. Um, and I always advise my clients, you know, put your values visually because if you're stuck in a meeting room and someone is telling you all these values, it's actually very impactful um, to have a visual um, or an artwork that reinforces those exact values uh, behind you as you say them. So that's the one thing. Obviously, you know, UBP is also trusted on the long term of their clients and I think art is very much an investment of at any period of time. And I think this suits them for that matter because it's a lot of the discourse that they give to their, their clients in terms of their investment strategies. So again, having um, up and rising talents which are becoming a very strong investment over the long term matches the way they kind of communicate with their talents. Less space as well, it's really beautiful in the space. Like they just got a stunning building in central Monaco. And the fact that they can have 41 artworks um, I think as a private bank is, is a big statement, you know, it's going to be a very different experience um, than walking into any other kind of financial body, I think, in that matter. Um, and I feel that, and, and, and you know, what's really nice about them is that they really do trust us for the expertise of it, um, to making sure that the communication is aligned, the marketing is aligned, we'll pick the right artists and we'll kind of go with who they want to become um, and, and who they want to say they are. So, and finally, um, we actually handle the same clients. Um, so, you know, back to kind of the page that we're looking at, this is also an exchange of database um, amongst two companies. And, and I think mm -hmm. as, you, as you both know, we will be handling a similar community of people who have similar um, expectations and belief and, and, and wishes as well. So, you know, um, the clients of UBP and, and the clients of MTR have crossed overs and, and have gone from one way to another into the expertise of the other partner as well. So this makes a lot of sense from a pure database perspective. So this gets me to, if you look at Rosewood London and Sofitel, uh, which are here in the central page, this is a similar thinking for Rosewood London. They very much want to do the marketing of the communication of the hotel. It's a five-star luxury hotel in Hong Kong and in London and in Paris through the Korean as well. So from a marketing and communication perspective, the, the artworks will align with what they're saying and with their values and also with the aesthetics. And so this will feel like the story is continuing in the same way that they've said it. From the client database perspective, they are also attracting collectors to their situs. You know, UBP is positioning itself saying, as the industry and the art industry is growing, we will attract more art collectors to our firm as well. So there's also an attraction of, of communities. So that will be something that I think a luxury and you see Pumilato will be in the same um, thinking when they activated with David on their Bond Street store. They want to attract art collectors, not just people who love jewelry. And it's very smart because they are facing Sotheby's. So they, everyone who can come out of Sotheby's and who loves art is now attracted to them, but may not have been attracted to them um, if it was pure jewelry. So I think, you know, art is something that is um, increasingly something that people want to be a part of as a social club, as a network, as a community, and, and ultimately companies are also tapping onto this um, as a level of communication. Um, I think if you look at the Eiffel Tower um, little picture, I think I put an image a bit lower down the slides of this, didn't I? Yeah, we have it here. This amazing project, say, 
I didn't mention because I wanted you to talk to us about it yeah. because I think it's so impressive this project you have been through. So do me a favor, do Google uh, SAPE, S-A-Y-P-E, Eiffel Tower, because this looked like a mock-up, but it was actually something real. But the scale is so enormous and it feels like this is some kind of computer generated image, which isn't. Um, this is 800 meters. I can press show from where you are talking from the internet as yeah, well. So you'll see all the images, the Google images, and oh guys, I mean, this is real, they did it. <laughs> you can Google it in real time as well. And I feel the best answer is always Google it. It's, it's a safe answer. So that's 800 meters of badly we will paint that was on the Sean Mars. So we launched this last year with 30 B Corp companies. So for anyone who doesn't know what a B Corp is, we are a B Corp. It means that like you are measured in profit, but you are also measured in regards to your diversity and sustainable impact. So you're basically a you know, you're doing business for good. Um, you are trying to align your processes with your value system. So we have had, mm -hmm. so like, let's say um, Innocent, the drinks will be one of them. Um, Patagonia uh, will be a B Corp, right? So there's quite a lot of big companies who will be a B Corp. Um, we, tra we transfer is also a B Corp. So basically we had the finances of 30 of them. And then we partner up with the mayor of Paris, the Garden Media Group and the Eiffel Tower. And the artists did this enormous uh, biodegradable paint um, across the grass. Um, the idea very much here was one, because it's biodegradable, it's a sustainable message. A lot of street art is sadly toxic and using toxic materials. So you cannot really make a sustainable statement about it. The second thing is that was a message of unity, which was very much launched on the refugee day, which was something that people were very passionate and the mayor of Paris specifically. But I think here you have an understanding of how cities are now using art to communicate a very powerful message and making sure, as you've seen on Google, that the media coverage about the city is going to be incredibly positive, which I think is very smart because ultimately, if the mayor of Paris had given a speech about this, like this may have been translated to two or three languages and they would have been forgotten two days later, right? So the impact of it would have been very small. Now, doing this with art, the impact is way larger. So again, back to thinking of art as a communication tool and the idea that you could talk about something and, and have what you talk about visually behind you. This is the Mayor of Paris impactful statement and that's something that's so much better remembered. She's constantly talking about sustainability and that's a really strong statement of, of doing it that way. So um, it, it goes back on, on having um, art also as a visual content um, further than just a tangible physical work of art, if that makes sense. True. Thank you. Thank you for your very clear explanation. I think that this work is really wonderful. It's amazing. Mm. I have another question on the relation between agency and artist. Uh, most of the time in Italy, uh, the professional relationship between artists and gallerists, uh, whose role is uh, traditionally assigned to the promotion of the artist, is not regulated by contract, but often it's based on a verbal agreement. MT Art, of course, is not a gallery, but it's an agency. Before you mentioned that uh, MT Art mm -hmm. covers studio costs of the artist sells their work and implements cultural and commercial um, partnership. On the legal point of view, how is regulated the relationship between the artist and the agent, agency? And um, yeah, for please. example, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can, if you want, you can go after I, I will. Yeah, I will uh, so, no, it's a great question. So, um, Basically, um, you know, contracts for me are essential, uh, not just to protect us and the artists in that contract, but also protect our partners and collectors who are therefore going to be working or collecting the works of the artists. Let's say I'm, you know, I'm working in a traditional way and I'm telling you this artist is and their work are worth 10,000 pounds. And I've done really well and I've built the market of the artist and the artist so far has done really well. But just suddenly there's something that goes wrong and the artist wants to leave or is having a breakdown or, you know, is having a conflict of all forms, which is, let's face it, something that's pretty common for tan management, right? If you don't have a contract, then you are in a place where like everything just falls apart, right? 
and you have still constructed a value, a market value, and you have said to your collectors, this is a 10,000 pounds market value. So you do need a contract first to have the timing to assess this. And actually, um, we had our first worst conflict in five years through the confinement, um, which is always good because I'm saying it's smiley, but it was definitely not a smiley time for eight weeks to kind of have to handle it. But it it's actually shows that our contracts are really good because it was fair for both parties. And it meant that I was able to call all partners and collectors and readjust with them on what the plan was because they had taken part in the career and the market of the artist and all the, the artist was acting incredibly irrationally and um, at that point, which we can all understand with the confinement, this is something that has happened, it meant that like it protects partially the, the, the market of the artist. If the artist can just leave and everything is just done, it's just a lot harder to protect it in that instance. So I feel it's it's always it's obviously like when I first talked to con about contracts to artists, they were like, "This is crazy and this is really aggressive." I see a contract as a protection, and again, you know, that contract was protecting her too. Even if she was horrid during that time, it was still something that was protecting her, which I think is when you know that there's a really fair contract being built, it's a bit like a prenup that you know that even when you hate the person, it's still protecting you, then you know that this is the right thing to do. So I'm a complete advocate for contracts. I 90% of galleries still don't have contracts. This is crazy. And you know, you are spending thousands of thousands of pounds. Every two days, there's a story of someone that has not delivered the works, but have kept the money. There's God knows how many stories because it's a non-regulated market economically. So I, it, it's for me so obvious that you need contracts and that you need to know that who is working with the talent also has a contract, that you're not in a place where, you know, you would end up just having something that's not valuable, was told that it was valuable, if that makes sense. So I feel the fact that we have a contract, the fact that we support them in the long term, the fact that we have the reputation means that people feel comfortable with our pricing and the fact that this is not just going to kind of crash all at once if there's a problem. And the reason I smile when I said I had my worst conflict and it was okay is because actually I feel the contracts always get proven in times of worst conflicts, which obviously are not pleasurable, but shows that like there's a solidity both in the company but also in the contract that was put in place. And, and for us, that was a good sign that you know, we had built that. Um, we had built that even in the worst case scenario, this was a protection mechanism. Yeah, I agree with you, of course, and we are work for this. Um, I have another little question about um, the relation, I mean, so the contract. Um, you use um, whether you use to provide an exclusivity clause in this kind of cost or contract with your artist. So, so we are an exclusive talent agency. So, um, you know, we don't really compare ourselves to a gallery because we don't, like we're much more similar to the talent agencies that you see in music, sport and film that we are in the way we run and that in the way that a gallery would do. So all we ask is to be the exclusive talent agency. So you cannot sign with another agent, you cannot sign with another talent agency, but you can work with a gallery and we will help you kind of doing that. You can work with an advisor. Um, again, we, do, we didn't see that as a direct investor, but we do see, obviously, another time agency as a direct investor. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because it's all about also the trust you are building around your artists from your partners and your collectors. And especially you are working close, closely with collectors, you said, also in investing in sense of supporting and championing the career of the artist, which is kind of different from a normal sale in a gallery, I would say. So yeah. you need to protect also the market and the value, right? But how yeah. is this value growing over time and why you think, how you establish that it's growing? Because you are in control of the value of the, your artist and somehow, right? So why not after two years maybe it's two percent more the price so um it, as basic as offer and demand so obviously if someone um loses people wants the same artist and this is a definite um time for increase and we'll communicate about this the other thing will be there will be key milestones for their carriers so let's say if they have a big solo exhibition so museum exhibitions so big public art projects so I think that really kind of make them step up as a as a carrier. 
then obviously um, at that point this is when you can also do an increase. Um, we are generally super fair in, in the pricing. So, you know, we we have all types of prices on board and very comfortable with something that is a very low price as much as a high price because it's important for us that we show full transparency in how do we price, you know, and, and that's something that we therefore feel um, quite passionate about. So it, it's, and I think you mentioned the investment. I think it's, you know, for me, what's important is again, going from a background where um, I'm not from the art world as a family, then, you know, people who are not familiar with the art world, for, for some of them, some of my early collectors, they have put a lot of money and, and trust to us. So I would want a full transparency of pricing. I would want the company to report where the artist is at. And, and you've seen our social media is also very transparent with how we kind of run the company. Because again, I have, of course have the super wealthy as part of the company, but I also have people who, you know, they do need to make sure that if they lose their job or if something goes wrong, this is something they can resell. And this is something that is actually of value. So I feel, you know, this is where for us and, and back to kind of my social values, it's why it's important for me to be transparent because as much as you've seen on one of our key advisors, Frédéric Jousset is worth two billion and I have people like this who can take enormous risk and buy 20 artists at once and do it over eight to ten years and see what happens. I also have people who can uh, work only buy one work and this has to work and there needs to be um, a transparency where the artist is at, where we're trying to get the artist to and, and needs to be a relationship with us and, and we always offer that if needs of selling back then they can also reach out back to us, you know. So I think it's important to cater for both because most people like I am would need to be careful about what they buy. Definitely, definitely. Also because it's money for people, it's passion, I mean, but it's passion that you want to be rewarded. Obviously it's an aesthetic way, but you don't want your artist to disappear. That's also, I mean, trust, but it's also your reputation then in charge. So that's important for the contracts and the real relation with your artist, which is, I feel much more closer than how it's today in the gallery. It used to be like this in the gallery business, maybe years ago, but the growth of the art market just get people, the galleries, the dealer, fa farther and farther from the artist somehow, right? So you have a personal relation with your artist. Yeah, and I feel, you know, the reality also after 11 years of managing talents is they are, we, we love them, but they are very difficult to manage, I think is the answer. And so we are lucky that we have the right incentives because we do have a work for, from our talents per year. So whether they become a nightmare or not, um, we are building our collection just the same way that our partners or collectors are doing that. And I think therefore that, you know, we are much more professional about it um, because we know that there can be highs and lows, but we're still protected even if there is a low. But I think the truth is, you know, in defense of the galleries is I'm 11 years in of managing talents. And I know that so many of our partners wants to work with us, not to be working too closely with the artists, get the benefits of the scale of the art project, get, you know, mm -hmm. all of this uh, creativity with them. And, and that's, in, in inspiring exchange, but in reality, they want someone else to be managing um, the talents daily. So I think that's a reality. I think for us, because of the business works and, and makes money and, and grow, then we're happy to take that on. Um, but the reality with the galleries is also, I think they are only now willing to manage and spend a lot of costs and resources towards the very top one, because why would you um, kind of go through all this pain for something that has so little gain on, on the Gary model level for an emerging up and coming artist. Yeah, you are working to build a sustainable career since the beginning, not just when they are already launched, because usually you have the artist launched from the very emerging gallery who is striving to survive and then the mega gallery take over them. But, but there's not the full control of the process and sometimes you lose also the artist meanwhile. So yeah, I think exactly. that's why your model is a kind of successful also in the mind of collectors when you get into, because you see that it's a more sustainable way to approach the artists as professionals, as entrepreneurs themselves today. They are not 
without knowledge of the business, right? Yeah, and, and I actually highly encourage artists to constantly get out there and compare us with other companies, specifically for that reason that I do believe in knowledge's power. And I, I do want, you know, it's, it's when artists are scared, you know, to have contracts, I always say, just go and read about all the conflicts that arise with the lack of contracts. So just go and inform yourself with every consequence that can arise on the decision that you want to make. Stop listening to a sector that can sometimes be, you know, more the word of mouth than actually the wisdom of the facts, if that makes sense. So it's definitely more in our philosophy that, you know, we, we suggest that they share our contracts to a few close people around them. We suggest that basically they really go and compare because we do believe that them being eligible would would them valuing what we do. And I think that's important as well in that relationship. True, true. If you have any questions from the public, we have one question. Uh, so, Arai is asking, what is the best advice you could give to someone trying to forge a career in the art world, specifically in art advising? How you start to build this relation with collectors and your place in the art world? I think just not being scared to have strong opinions. Um, Ultimately, um, you know, many people are scared to not please or not be liked. And yeah. um, with any job, it's important to be respected. Whether someone or not likes you, I mean, it's always nicer when someone likes you, but it's important to be respected first and foremost. And in advising, you need to be in a place where you can tell someone not to go for something um, yeah. and position yourself against that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's a lot of the times the no that you've made and the things that you've said that were also know that's going to make someone also go for you when it's a yes you know so I feel just position yourself I see a lot of people who try to please more than positioning and positioning um you know does basically I mean you, you don't you want to position yourself on things that you believe in but it will nurture a community of people that will respect you out of that positioning true true so Talking about you, how you placed, placed yourself in the art world, how you started, you started with the managing a gallery, right? So essentially yeah. it was a primary market or secondary market first? How so do I you was in the primary market. market. Um, I mean, my first boss, um, when I was 21, um, I was managing the guy in the Outsiders. So he spotted Banksy and JR. Um, mm. So lots of big figures in the street art market. So. Banksy was definitely a level of secondary market um, because at the time already uh, when they had split, um, he had left over 300 paintings to Steve Lazaridis. Um, so he was definitely the biggest dealer of the paintings of Banksy. Um, I feel I started doing secondary market for our talents. I tend to not want to do too much secondary market just purely because I like to control the, the markets I'm in um, because I, I like to be fully knowledgeable in them. So, you know, now that we're going into secondary market of ours, then I feel comfortable because I know uh, the market well, I know the, the number of people that are kind of part of it, and, and I feel I therefore have a good knowledge to advise again what the price on the secondary or what the action on secondary market should be. Um, I am not feeling comfortable to be advising on secondary markets unless I have this level of knowledge, um, which I think is also the reason why funds uh, lack to invest in our artists, because they know that we would only suggest artists who we feel we are in complete full knowledge of, um, right. that this is the right investment. And, and that's something I'm quite attached to because um, our sector doesn't have a good reputation in regards to investment. And, and I wanted to kind of be sure that we were the ones that were constantly having the right reputation over it. True, true. So if you have any questions from the audience, guys, feel free. You can yeah, interact yeah. with the left panel. We have Christopher yeah. Bark telling you that it was great, the Paris project, such an incredible project. And if you don't have a uh, like question, Elisa, I have some other question for Marine. Yeah, just, you can go. just to see if they want to interact. Yeah, I can go. Okay. Marine, changing topic. The global pandemic situation has requested a rethinking of how to use work of art and set up cultural events. 
what have been the impact on your business and what kind of reflection have you done about it? Yeah, I feel um, so I'm in an incredibly fortunate position because I have one of those businesses that comes out stronger and, and started than, than when we started. So definitely very, very um, uh, positive about it. I, I've never worked that hard in my life. So I'm going to our Monaco office next week and just the idea to even be by a swimming pool for two hours, not doing anything is a complete <laughs> highlight of my life. Um, I'm also a young mother, so I had a seven months old at the start of the confinement um, that we became my chairman of uh, leading the confinement with me. So I think in March I was worried because, first of all, I had never been a young mother in that situation. And I thought, you know, will I be able to lead all of this while running the company? Um, so I took a very strange decision, but actually turned out to be the best decision we took. Um, I asked my Paris director, Louise um, Kusio-Bailak, to move into my house uh, two days before the lockdown. Um, the reason why is because I thought if we are two at, at the, as a core team, because we're obviously a bigger team, and we will be able to be constantly positive. So whatever negative arise, then we know that we will always be at 8 a.m. on the dot starting our day. And then one of us will have to balance the mental health and negativity that we basically get as we kind of lead the company. So I've actually had a really blissful confinement with her because um, it's been so nice to kind of manage it at two and we felt really like this, you know, in the tunnel, um, you know, kind of dealing with uh, what we expected to be the worst. For me, what I felt was really nice was the fact that our collectors continued to buy us, but also said how much of a difference it was making. For the lucky ones who still kept their jobs, um, they were not spending money on restaurants, on traveling, and they were looking at their houses a lot more. And, and the fact that like they need to be inspired daily. So we were lucky that therefore we were getting this um, on the artworks. On the public art side, we still had all our projects um, kept, just delayed. So um, in August, I'm launching a gigantic, um, gigantic public art project on Trafalgar Square, which is we haven't announced yet, but it's going to be absolutely magical. Um, so, you know, I feel on, on that perspective that the public art projects have very much kind of continued. And brand collaboration wise, they have all transferred to digital, but they still commission our artists to produce visual content for it. So we were in a very lucky position. I, um, and I think from a financial and business perspective, like I mentioned one of our key advisors, Frédéric Jousse, who is basically mm -hmm. the biggest patron of the Louvre Museum. And his company, WebHelp, sold for 2.4 billion um, over the last few months. And he, we had bigger people wanted to come on board after the conference, after the way we led it, um, which was definitely, I think, a tribute to the fact that my team was like this. We got introduced by Ludovica, who has been incredible. And I think we just yes. had this very positive way of motivating everyone and just going at it. And every single day we pitch and every single day we've tried to obtain something. The one thing negative that I would say is um, the conflict that I mentioned with my talent, which for me personally was someone that I was also close to personally on top of the professional. And I feel that as we all know, conflicts or mental health has definitely been impacting certain people. Um, and that's something that has been tough to watch because I had to watch a talent self-destruct. Um, and that's a talent that we had specifically very much looked after. Now, as I say on the positive is um, our contracts are well structured and also we were able to kind of respond to it in a very fair way, which I'm very proud of because I'm definitely South of France type of blood. So we are, you know, if we feel attacked, we definitely respond, you know, we do not uh, wait to kind of say if something goes wrong. And the fact that we could um, handle it, thinking of the long term, um, with the contract kind of put that way, is a tribute to the fact that we are no more a young company who respond very passionately in those situations, but we actually a structured company, which means that you know we have processes even in the worst case scenarios, um, and and that makes me very proud, and, and I have generally learned so much from that experience. Um, but I think that's the one regret I have is. Could I have prevented her mentally going that way? Then maybe, and, and that's something as an entrepreneur, when you're trying to kind of 
avoid for the crisis to impact your business and you, you i maybe no, i don't have i maybe not have spent as much time dealing with this so um so yeah that's basically my full learning curve but um, we've opened two new offices in the crisis, which is insane. Um, I think if you think about it, and we are definitely feeling very fortunate otherwise. I think it's all about leadership. You are showing the right leadership also to your team, and you are able to take them all together to your mission. Yeah, I'm believing. We have another question, and then we close because otherwise we are going out of time. Uh, Andrea Canzano is asking, have contrast providing more agency to artists themselves? Has been any pushback from galleries, partners, collectors, as this sort of formality is very new in the art world? As we were saying, it's, it's more an end shaking business since now. But contrasts are yeah. so important today, as you saw, especially today with the COVID, we saw with the pandemic, so many conflicts arise between yeah. artists, gallery, between leaders. Yeah. I feel like we, I had my fair shares of pushback when I started. So in a way, I'm very uh, chill and relaxed when it comes to pushbacks because I've had all of this right at the start. You know, I feel 90% of people in the art world come from a, a lot of money, uh, family-wise. And I came from no money and I wanted to change the way things were done. So, And I was 25. So it was mix of ambitious and arrogance because I think when you're young you also have a level of which you think it is possible and and I therefore mm -hmm. had definitely my fair shares of attacks and pushbacks five years ago when I was doing that um not anymore and that you know that was again back to this conflict the the rushing thing for me is that we had the backing of collectors when we were handling it over the past eight weeks with that conflict and we had the backing of people who we were working with and that shows that like i think we have built trust over the ways we're kind of leading our business um which is such a new level of business for me to kind of just be trusted you know i think i've been used to have to prove my trust constantly and have to prove that i can be trusted and i think it's it's definitely a really nice position to just be trusted um, and, and to kind of make sure that you can do the right job. I think when it comes to when I was 25, it was absolutely horrid. I had articles against me and personal attacks, um, anonymous accounts set up on Instagram as well. It's very violent and it showed that we were clearly onto something and that is what my business mentors told me. They said the only reason you're getting this is because you are onto something, which is the reason you need to continue because there's obviously something there. Um, now as a 25 years old girl how did i leave it it was just very tough i think but it does as everything it does toughen you up and you know I, I think whenever i see any form of bullying or any form of attacks and i'm very good at addressing it and and i'm not impressed with like you know receiving a legal letter or a threat or any form of shape doesn't impress me having gone through this and therefore i'm able to be very professional in handling all of this uh, thanks to it so in a way it, it builds up your strengths so that you can also lead your team when the next challenge arrives. But it was definitely not very nice. Yeah, you need a lot of strength to survive in the art world. But I see you as a very inspiring person for all the young girls trying to make their way in the art world as well. Both as artists, as you know, you are facing pushback as you are a girl, as you are young, as you are a woman. So it's also a very male dominated business for a long time. So we are changing a little bit the game again. So thank you, Maureen, for your for this conversation. I think uh, it, it has been very inspiring for all of us. And thank you for joining us. And we hope you will join us also for next webinars. This was part of a webinar series also uh, more on wealth management issues. We are held in every Monday, but it's essentially usually in Italian. We might think for another one in arts if you would like to join us. So thank you, Marine, again. Thank you, Massimiliana. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a really good question. You've challenged me, so this is good. I was happy because you we sometimes challenge every question. <laughs> it was a great conversation. Thank you, Marine. So, bye, thank everyone, you. and see you next time. Bye. Goodbye. That was great.